Thursdays, your source of animal rights news and gossip packed into a short, sweet three minutes on everyone's favorite day, which of course is a Thursday. Welcome, Three Minute Thursdays. Great to have you here. Lots of stuff has been going on in the last few weeks. Let's talk about it. Welcome to episode 135. It has been a whirlwind three weeks. I'm like, you know, I'm gonna keep making videos this whole time that I've been gone, but I, uh, I haven't. Fun fact, I filmed episode 135, um, and then I took the SD card out of my camera to bring it with me to Italy, and I'm like, I'm gonna edit it out of the plan, I'll upload it when I get to Italy, and then and then I forgot the SD card um, in San Francisco, and I never made the video, so there's actually an episode 135 out there. Well, not out there, but uh, filmed, and you'll never see it. You know, you're disappointed. But, uh, cool thing, I went to the Bay Area, then I went to Italy, I went to like Rome, then I went to some small town outside of Rome, um, and then I went to Milan, and we did screenings of the animal people, and we had conversations and talked and met some amazing people, super exciting, and then I flew from Milan to Cincinnati, as one does, um, for a big uh, protest against Procter & Gamble, and then I went to Las Vegas for a couple days to speak at the Las Vegas, Las Vegas Veg Fest, which was great. If you live in the area, you should definitely go next year. Um, and then I flew home, and now I'm just exhausted, but I'm like, there's so much to talk about. How can I not do a video this week? I'm gonna do it. I got it. Episode 135 with like a little asterisk next to it. Patreon is going on. Um, this is gonna be a cool month. If you thought about joining, now's the time to join. It's gonna be match, but also I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna distribute all the money to a, a lot of different places, like small grassroots groups and small sanctuaries or micro sanctuaries or small projects like that. So it's gonna be a cool way to like donate a couple bucks, have it matched a couple times and then spread out hopefully around the world to some really cool places that maybe don't often get a lot of attention um, through donations or otherwise. So if you wanna join, please do so. It's, it's gonna be a great month, trust me. So much has happened in the past few weeks uh, in the animal rights world and clearly I've let you down. Um, as you well know, I am your one and only source of animal rights news and the gossip. And without me, where would you turn? Social media? <laughs> Come on. So let me do a quick rundown of the big ones that happened and then we'll dive in to the chunk, the, the meat of the, uh, the coconut meat of the video. So the country of Latvia has banned fur, which I think is pretty great. The parliament supported a complete ban on the breeding of fur animals in the fur farming uh, in the country starting in 2028. So after like 10 years of campaigning by local animal rights activists, the ban was added to the animal protection law with a large majority of the votes in favor of it. It also should be noted that the farmers will not be receiving financial compensation from the government, which I know is a big sticking point for a lot of, of, of animal rights activists out, out there. No financial compensation. It was kind of like successfully argued that the five year transition phase is compensation enough for fur farmers to figure out what else to do with their miserable lives. If you've been following along with the Excelsior 4 case in Canada, uh, that was four people that were arrested for their part in a meet the victims out there, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, two had their charges dropped or dismissed and it left uh, Amy and Nick uh, who went to trial. They were unfortunately found guilty. And then this week they were sentenced to 30 days in jail, which is disappointing to say the least. But what they were able to do was stay their sentence upon appeal. Let's see what happens. So that's where we're at now. Um, and we are keeping an eye on that case. And of course we wish them the best of luck. California has become the first US state to ban toxicity testing on dogs and cats. Well, it's not like a complete victory against animal testing. It's a first step that I, I think is kind of a good one. So starting January 1st, 2023, it will be illegal to perform unnecessary toxicity tests on pesticides, uh, chemical substances, and other toxic products on cats and dogs. The kicker there, of course, is like unnecessary. Who's deciding what's necessary and, and unnecessary? So it could be a non-win. Non it could be a good step in the right direction, which would be a great point to put in like the Delta column during a plus Delta of the campaign. What the hell is a plus Delta? Great question. It's a way to gather feedback about a practice. Uh, essentially is what it is. So in organizing spaces, uh, it's often used in campaign or action debriefs. So why is it called the plus delta? I don't know. But you're basically making a column of the good and the bad and you're dumping your points in there and then using it to frame your next steps, your next campaigns, your next actions, so you can kind of figure out what went wrong, what went right, plan accordingly. So there's been a few big movement moments the past couple of weeks. So maybe we can do like an informal uh, plus delta of one. You know, just for fun. Let's talk about the Smithfield trial. It's a big one. Everyone's talking about it. The short of the long is that Wayne and Paul from Direct Action Everywhere went into a Smithfield factory farm uh, in Utah, I believe, in March of 2017 and took two pigs, 
and did an investigation into the farm. They released their findings through the New York Times and took the pigs to a sanctuary to live their lives. And then in August of 2017, the FBI raided the sanctuary looking for the pigs. And shortly after that, they arrested, I believe, four people in connection with the raid. So the pigs remain in the sanctuary, thankfully. Two people pled out, they took deals, and then Paul and Wayne stayed on to fight the case in court. That is the incredibly short of the long, but this week, uh, the jury trial finally concluded and Paul and Wayne were found not guilty. If you want to um, read up on the trial and the case, there's this cool new webpage uh, that will point you to all the info. They put all the info on one page. You can scroll through it. It's, it's what, Fred, what's it called? Go Google? Oh, uh, apparently it's called Google. Uh, Google.org, I'm guessing. But And this was done as part of a bigger campaign called Right to Rescue, which, if I understand correctly, is the idea to expose conditions and, and, and rescue animals from places of use, like factory farms and laboratories. Do it openly, and then invite kind of like a, quote, confrontation with the legal system in hopes to use necessity defenses or simply persuade a jury that they should not be found guilty for saving suffering animals. Pushing this would expand their abilities to have a, quote, right to rescue sick and dying animals out of out of these places of use. So let's uh, plus and delta, shall we? Yeah, why not? I think the obvious plus right from the start is that Wayne and Paul were found not guilty. That, that's great news. I'm happy for you too. No activist should want another activist to go to jail or prison, and this obviously is no exception. I'm glad they will remain free and get to do the activism that they want to do. Also, in the plus category. Two pigs remain at the sanctuary, and you can't put a price on that, right? Liberation, that's what the core of the movement is. This case has had an enormous amount of public tension on it. Um, some good, some bad, but the focus, due to the nature of the court case, was heavily on Smithfield and the pigs and people engaging in animal activism, and whether or not that was acceptable or not. The media included what I thought was like a really well-penned piece by Wayne in the New York Times after he was found not guilty. So I would also put that in the plus column. It's hard to do this when you're like looking at the camera and the monitor and you're trying to figure your hands are good. Maybe I'm just not very good at this stuff. I don't know, but you get the picture. So anyways, I would put that in the plus column. What else I would put in the plus column is that this was an attack, for lack of a better term, against Smithfield, which is a huge corporation. It's the opposite of Wayne's last trial where he was found guilty for raiding a tiny backyard farm, not once, but twice. Uh, and while there was an argument to be made that that may have helped push forward the right to rescue and the issue. It, it was an argument that I, I personally disagreed with, but that's either here nor there. But regardless, let's go after the corporations, right? The industry. And I think this trial did that and, and, and this action did that in a, in a great way. Plus call. I have one point that I'm not sure where it belongs because I can never get like a clear answer from anyone involved. I've asked a bunch of times. I don't recall ever getting a straight answer. But my point is, generally, if you're arrested or you're charged with something, often you're given conditions of release or pretrial conditions, which essentially is probation until your court case is complete. So while you're waiting for your court case to come to fruition or you, a, a good deal to come your way, you are put on what are essentially like terms of probation. Of course, like you don't have to follow these rules, but legally speaking, you do. But you're, you're not to break any laws. Any laws. And sometimes there are travel restrictions with it too. You can't travel here or there without permission. So if you're an activist that engages in sometimes risky behavior, uh, open rescues, or even just attending protests, you know, these can really put the proverbial handcuffs on you, sometimes for years. But I can only assume that like a, a number of the people arrested on these cases have these conditions because it's common. But again, no one has said one way or the other. So maybe no one's had them. Maybe everyone's had them. Maybe no one wants to say. I don't know. But it, depending on if you have them or not, that is a plus or a delta. So yeah, that being said, if that was the case and you had them, I would put them strongly in the delta column. If the idea is to push the right to rescue and to encourage people to engage in the same behavior, uh, you're essentially putting a bunch of people potentially on probationary conditions for years. And if they existed in the Smithfield case, you had those probationary uh, rules for you know, almost five, what, six years almost. These trials don't go away quickly. They can take years to resolve themselves. And if you look at these right to rescue cases, a lot of them are from 2017, 18, 19. And then if you're found guilty or you plead to a deal, like a lot of people end up doing in these right to rescue cases, they are getting fines. They're getting probation. They're getting community service. Again, sometimes years of probation or a suspended sentence, which basically says, again, if you break the law, any law, over the course of those years, you can be resentenced to the crimes you were found guilty of. So it could be like, you know, you get 17 months in, in jail, suspended, meaning uh, you follow the rules, but if you don't, you could end up doing that 17 months 
if you get arrested. So I'm no attorney, obviously, that comes as no surprise, but these are the realities of going before a legal system in the United States. Wayne was also found guilty in North Carolina for a right to rescue case, uh, and he was sentenced to two felonies. And as someone who has felonies on their record, it doesn't always make life easy. I have federal, he has state fel felonies, if I'm not mistaken, so it could be different. But either way, it can be a hindrance on, on your life. So something to think about. But, but of course, we aren't doing activism to lead an easy life. You know what I mean? We have to take risks, but, but I digress. So, so those are things I would probably put in the Delta column. But yeah, I, I think there are like uh, un unfortunate consequences to our actions. And that shouldn't necessarily sway us away from action. I'm not suggesting we be passive, but I do think if we can avoid them, we should. And, and I still maintain a lot of the same outcomes in our plus column could be achieved without showing our faces and avoiding prosecution. And in the past when I've said this, those that have disagreed with me immediately assume that what I'm saying is like, if we're not doing open rescue, then we are clearly forming clandestine liberation cells with balaclavas and bolt cutters and Molotov. Just to be clear, that is not what I'm saying at all. I'm simply saying you can just uh, crop footage really easily to just take out a few things, you know, easy peasy. And a final word of caution that could end up in my Delta column, depending on how things in this trial shapes the right to rescue campaign in the future, is that this should not be seen as like a free for all. According to the right to rescue webpage, there are uh, 11 cases stemming from the campaign in the US over a period of years with five of them being closed. All the cases have included people either being found guilty, pleading guilty and taking deals, being put on probation or paying fines or doing community service or a mix of all of those things. And some defendants in some of the cases have had their charges dropped. This case in Smithfield, the current one, to the best of my knowledge, is the first time right to rescue defendants have been found not guilty by jury, which is great. I'm happy that happened. And I think it could lead to some interesting things. But all that just to say, proceed with caution. I'm not suggesting we don't take risks or we don't be bold. What I'm saying is don't be reckless. Understand the difference between risky and reckless. One not guilty verdict doesn't mean the floodgates are open. If you're going to engage in actions like this, do your own plus deltas and, and understand the potential outcomes of your action and discuss how those outcomes can be avoided if you want them to be avoided. Communicate with one another. Have difficult conversations. It's okay to talk like this and say, hey, this worked and this didn't work, even if you're coming at it from an outside perspective. We are allowed to disagree with one another. That's how we learn from one another. We grow from one another and we become stronger as a movement. And finally, please, please, please don't take animals you don't have homes for or you can't support, particularly if they can't properly be rehabbed and or return to the wild. There's been enough stories of people rescuing animals, then raising a bunch of money off of the open rescue to support the work and the animals and then dumping the animals out of sanctuary. And the sanctuary never sees a penny of the raised funds. Taking care of animals that have undergone huge amounts of trauma is an incredibly expensive undertaking. Like sanctuaries don't just provide safe living, they provide healthy living. And that is not cheap for any animal that has spent their whole lives on factory farms. So please be prepared with not just homes, but resources. Be responsible with your actions. Let's not put them or the sanctuaries at risk by identifiably advertising their new homes. Let's just let the animals live their lives. Which leads, which leads me to wonder, uh, like if the right to rescue was a huge thing and, and it became possible that you could rescue sick and dying animals off of farms and labs, which are like every animal on a farm in a lab, what's the plan for the millions, if not like billions of animals you can actually take? Like where are they all gonna live? Who pays for all of that? I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm taking the, the right to rescue a little too literally. So there you have it, my pluses and Deltas for the Smithfield action. Bottom line, it had some great pieces in it. And I th also think it's a cautionary tale. I wanted to do a plus delta for that like Van Gogh soup fiasco thing, but I ran out of time. I wrote about it on my Instagram if you wanna go get into a fight in the comment sections. Enjoy yourself. But if you like these breakdowns, let me know. Maybe I can do it next week. And I, and I hope if nothing else, you find this tool helpful. Debriefing what went right and what went wrong, even as an outsider, is really important for our activism. It helps us build stronger strategies. It helps us learn from those who did the work before us. It allows us to shift away from the pitfalls and towards the successes. And then ultimately, it allows us to keep fighting.